Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nuno Garup. I'm a professor at the law school, and I'm also a member of the Cultures of Law in Global Contacts, and I'm introducing our speaker today, Professor Tom Ginsburg. Before I do that, I have been instructed by Professor Shao to go over explaining what's the Center for Advanced Study Initiatives and what's the cultures of law in global context. I really have to read. I mean, we have been doing this for more than a year. I still have to read it. Um, so the Center for Advanced Study Initiatives are among our campus highest profile annual events, attracting broad audiences from on and off campus. This initiative seeks to promote and sustain meaningful interdisciplinary discussions around topics of widespread interest across our campus. Recent initiatives have included sovereignty and autonomy in the Western Hemisphere and culture as data, social sciences on the internet. In addition to a public speaker series on cultures of law and global context this year, so I guess that's us, and a graduate seminar is being planned for spring 2014. So let me also take the, uh, to remind you that the next speaker will be uh, Tuesday, November 19th, Tamara Luz from Cornell, discussing self-exile and self-censorship, uh, Prince uh, Prisdang of Siam before Les Majesty, at, here at the same place. And this is uh, a series of uh, speakers with, uh, within our uh, group, Cultures of Law in, in Global Contexts. Now, we are a group that tries to uh, promote interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and transnational research. We are an intersect initiative of the Graduate College at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and essentially our focus is on humanities, social sciences, and the law in particular examining synergies of culture and law in various contexts. It involves various faculty members. And uh, not Shaw, but Faisal asked me to circulate this where you can actually have your name down, hang on, name, department, and email, and you have to say if you're a faculty participant or a graduate participant in our initiatives. Of course, we also have a beautiful web page and all these things, we are very modern. Okay, we have all this stuff, and we actually respond to emails. Okay, now, it's an honor to introduce Tom Ginsburg. Um, Tom B Ginsburg needs no uh, introduction, actually, so I, I'm not sure if I'm uh, doing um, anything that's actually needed. And I, I told Tom I'm not one of those people who's going to take 15 minutes to introduce him, talking about my own research. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about Tom's research. So Tom, everybody knows, is, uh, is a high-profile uh, scholar on uh, comparative international law, law and politics, law and economics. He's currently the Leo Splitz Professor of International Law, the Ludwig and Wild Wolf Research Scholar and Professor of Political Science at the University of uh, Chicago. He's a former faculty of, of, of Illinois. In fact, he left uh, our law school the year I was hired, so I think Tom wanted to run away from me. We have had this problem for a while. And um, he has published widely on um, comparative law and law and politics with a focus on East Asia. In fact, the main topic he's talking um, today. Uh, he has this famous book on judicial review and new democracies in 2003. And more recently, The, Endures, the Endurance of National Constitutions. Uh, the Comparative Constitutional Design. He also is one of the leaders of the Comparative Constitutions Project, an effort funded by the National Science Foundation to gather and analyze the constitutions of all independent nation states since 1789. And of course, I should also publicize our own book that hopefully will be out uh, next year. This is an attempt to commit Tom to have the book out next year. Okay, Tom, I think the floor is, uh, is yours. Tom has promised he will talk to around five, five-ish, and then we'll open the floor for, uh, for questions. Tom will keep the, the line. And as far as I understand, we, have, we are kicked out from this room at 5.30, that's what I've been told. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, thanks to you all for braving the heat today. I thought I'd be the only person in a coat. I see that's not true. Thank you, Faisal and uh, Pete, for, uh, for joining me in this uh, silly ritual. 
uh, but in fact, I encourage you to take your coats off. Um, great to be back here. You know, it's my intellectual home. Uh, it's where I started. I have so many friends here. Great to see former students and former colleagues who I miss terribly. Um, and for this particular project, it's a real pleasure to be back here because it's a project that I started just as I was, I started here at the University of Illinois, and I've never finished it. It's part of a large book project I've been working on for several years, and I haven't finished it in part because I've um, not resolved all the questions. And I hope that today you can help me work through uh, some with, with your own questions to help uh, refine my theory and to, to try to understand this important development that I want to talk about. Um, I first want to make uh, clear that what I'm talking, what the subject is, the title of the talk is From Modernism to Participation in East Asian Law. I'm primarily talking about Northeast Asia, and I'm primarily talking about three countries, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Much of what I say, I think, has implications for China, but I'm limiting the scope of my uh, discussion to those three systems. And there's a reason for doing so. They share a lot historically, uh, a lot of influences, particularly, um, as I will describe, um, all three heavily influenced by Meiji Japan and its attempt to modernize the legal system in the 19th century. The problem that I'm looking at is that all of these systems have radically changed their legal systems in the last 20 years. Radically. Maybe more radically than any other country. Even though we're at an era of legal reform in which there's lots of global pressures and funding uh, for countries to modernize their legal systems, these relatively rich countries have chosen to change the fundamental bases of their legal system. And I think that's an interesting problem. I think it calls out for analysis. These aren't countries like uh, Cambodia or Cameroon where you know, the World Bank can come and say you must reform your legal system. These are domestically driven processes. And um, the puzzle that I'm trying to work at is that Notwithstanding very similar starting points, and v but very different politics, they end up in relatively similar places. And so to try to understand this regional development, I use this notion of uh, participation, which is where the legal systems are going. The reason I have not finished the book is that my own tools, the tools I usually use to approach social, political, economic problems, don't seem to help explain uh, what's happened in East Asia. I'm, as some of you know, uh, fond of um, methods associated with rational choice, political science, economics, like Professor Garupa, who I've learned so much from. Um, and from those disciplines' point of views, what you usually try to do in understanding an episode of legal reform is to ask, you know, whose interests were these reform in, and uh, who was pushing them, and how was the outcome produced? And usually there's a pretty good match. We look for interest groups that drive law. But these reforms that I'm puzzling over, um, it, the prob problem is much more messy, and so I've had to turn to some other tools and sociology and such. What I want to do today is to jump back at a pretty high level and actually start with the great German sociologist Max Weber, who is a wonderful theorist of modernity, and uh, to sort of go back to a fundamental political problem that he identified um, and, of course, that many others have wrestled with. And that is the question of why do we obey authority? Why do we obey authority? Why do we obey the law? Why do we obey, we obey the state? Weber famously had three answers. Uh, he said there was traditional authority. We obey because we always have. The king has power because his father did and his grandfather, that kind of thing. The second category for Weber was charisma. And this is a very interesting area. I wish I could talk about it today, but I'm not going to. Charisma is when you have a, um, a new fusion of ideas that someone brings along. People followed Muhammad not because he was uh, traditional. In fact, it was because he was changing tradition because of the power of his personality. And you have charismatics throughout history, some good, some bad. Hitler, Stalin, Jesus, uh, many others. Um, so that's a reason we might obey. We might obey because the authority is so charismatic, we must follow. The third category for Weber, and the one that interested him the most, was what he called rational legal authority. It's really modernity. And in modernity, we follow authority um, because of the procedures by which the laws were enacted. We obey the laws of the US Congress not necessarily because we think they're good, but because we think that that procedure is the appropriate one. 
And um, we also, and part of Weber talks about this, you know, tend to think that we obey the authority because it's, it's good, it's rational. It is the best technical means to achieve a certain end. The whole discipline of economics actually draws its authority from this idea that we can give you an efficient solution to any particular problem. We can find the fastest way to get there. That's also a modern idea. Traditional authority never thought about that. Charismatics don't care about efficiency. So these are the ideas that make up you know, political authority in the modern era. Now, Weber was writing 100 something years ago. Um, and, um, you know, phenomenal thinker. But this category of rational legal authority, I think, can be broken up into different um, components. And I guess my first claim is that different legal systems at particular points in time will draw especially on a particular form or subform, if you will, of this Weberian modern authority. And the three that I want to offer, three sort of subcategories here, are uh, procedural legitimacy, performance legitimacy, and participatory legitimacy. And I'll explain each of those. Procedural legitimacy is pretty straightforward and should be very familiar to Americans. We Americans are particularly obsessed with procedure. We, and you know, a pretty good example is the due process clause of the US Constitution, which basically says that the government can do anything it wants to you, take your life, liberty, or property, as long as it follows the proper procedures. In Whenever we are confronted with new social problems in the United States, we tend to respond with procedural solutions. The rise of the administrative state gave rise to the Administrative Procedures Act. It didn't say things that the state could or couldn't do, so they had to follow certain procedures. Uh, desegregation was met with, uh, you know, gave rise to a whole revolution in criminal procedure, which you're all familiar with from watching television. Miranda rights and such. The government you know, has to read you these rights. They have to follow certain procedures. And um, you know, there's a large literature on this with regard to the United States. It seems to be our preferred mode to solve problems with procedure. That's one way, one version of sort of um, uh, modernist legitimacy. Um, but I think that what's been going on in East Asia for the last 130 years, 140 years since the Meiji Revolution is not drawn much on these kind of procedural forms. They're really rooted in common law notions of a trial, a very paradigmatic form of procedure for us, which we tend to uh, impose in all kinds of areas. And that, of course, is foreign to many parts of the world. In East Asia, in my view, for arguably you know, hundreds or millennia in some countries, uh, but certainly since the rise of the Meiji state, the primary mechanism of legitimacy hasn't been procedure but performance. It's my second category, performance legitimacy. What do I mean by that? We follow the government because the government delivers the goods. It's not because it's democratically elected. It usually wasn't. It's not because it follows fair procedures. It usually didn't. It's because under this particular government, whether it's modern-day Singapore under Lee Kuan Yew or Meiji Japan, under the oligarchs, we are getting good government. We're getting richer, we're getting happier, and that's a real form of legitimacy, um, performance legitimacy. And it is, as I will talk about a little bit more, a, a core idea about law having in, that uh, rose in the Meiji Restoration. Now, the third category I bring up is this idea of participatory legitimacy. And I, I do see this, of course, in some sense, it's a very ancient form um, that is quite familiar to lawyers. You know, the question, if you're involved, or if you look anthropologically at primitive systems of dispute resolution, you know, what happens, and the one I've been studying recently is the Pashtun tribal code that holds sway in Afghanistan and Pakistan. You know, the Pashtuns have a, an age-old system for resolving disputes. They get everyone in the village together, and they talk it out, and, you know, it might take three days, and eventually they resolve a dispute, sometimes doing barbaric things like transferring women from one family to another. Uh, nevertheless, these forms of dispute resolution are legitimate because everyone participates. It's a very ancient form. Modern day scholars of arbitration law are familiar with it. The reason big businesses you know, tend not to go to court is because they like arbitration. They can choose the law, choose the decision maker. Once you participate in those choices, of course you obey the result. Now, in the modern world, of course, we 
society is too complex for us to participate in every decision. But what I want to focus on is this idea of participatory legitimacy, that the system can be legitimated as long as it um, has some parts of the system in which we can symbolically participate, where you know, some representatives of the people are involved in the decision making. That's enough, in a way. And what I want to argue today, and is part of this project, is that in East Asia, we've been moving over the past few decades from a system of performance legitimacy, where all that mattered was that we were getting richer and good government was you know, uh, delivering the goods, to one where that matters less. And what matters more is a kind of symbolic participation. And I, I argue that this transformation can be seen in looking at the legal systems of East Asia, Northeast Asia. Now, um, I think I have to start in elaborating this claim by saying a little bit about the Meiji period in Japan, which may not be familiar to all of you, but in my mind, uh, one of the most remarkable periods of human history. When you have a government uh, that was basically uh, a feudal kind of aristocracy um, changing within 30 years to develop a modern industrialized state, the first non-Asian, non-Western power to ever defeat a Western power in war, um, and it was a lot about modernization. It was a hyperspeed program of modernization. Law was very central to the Meiji oligarchs. Why? Well, what had happened, um, for those of you unfamiliar with the history, is that the Westerners, the Americans and the British, had showed up and said, as they had said in China, as they had said in Southeast Asia, you will trade with us. And the Japanese said, no, we won't trade with you. And they said, you will trade or else. And so they were uh, forced to open up their markets and um, given a set of unequal treaties, which were called unequal treaties because Westerners uh, would not be subject to the jurisdiction of East Asian nations. The legal systems, were, it was claimed, were too barbaric, too uncivilized. East Asians, if they were to be arrested for a crime in Seattle or something like that, would be subject to Western jurisdiction. So there was an imbalance in these treaties. And coming from East Asia, the center of the world in you know, the Chinese worldview and um, you know, a great ancient civilization, this was quite a blow. Essentially, what the Westerners were saying is, they didn't realize this, but if you modernize your legal systems, then we're going to have to deal with you as equals. Law was the very essence of modernity in this uh, exchange, in this encounter between East and West. And so the Meiji uh, oligarchs, smart as they were, decided that they would focus on the legal system. And they built, I mean, among other things, while industrializing the country, built a modern legal system in roughly 30 years. And it's a very interesting story. It was a kind of authoritarian legal system. It wasn't a democracy, the Meiji Japanese government. Nevertheless, the legal system, in my view, was quite um, effective and powerful. It was a kind of version of authoritarian legality a government that even though it's a dictatorship, follows its own rules uh, because that's part of modernity. You have bureaucratic structure and within the bureaucracy, everyone follows their own procedure. Uh, and that can be perfectly functional within an authoritarian state. Maybe it's more functional in an authoritarian state than a democracy. The Meiji courts within 30 years, actually within about 20 years of being created, were already ruling against the government in the 1890s in important criminal cases. It's a pretty significant thing. And um, the legal system was, you know, again, adopted not really out of a, um, um, a deep felt sense that law should constrain government. Rather, it was a kind of instrumental adoption of these techniques as a way of gaining independence or maintaining independence. As one scholar put it, it was an inoculation against colonialism rather than infection by it. Now contrast all that with, let's say, law in the United States around the same time, the 1890s. We have very deep felt notions of law as being natural in origin, natural law. There are certain things government shouldn't do to you. Due process, which I mentioned before, has always been thought of in natural law terms, that you have a kind of natural right to a fair trial. It would be totally foreign idea in East Asia. Um, Law was not given by God on the mountain or something like that. Law was simply a tool of the state. And so 
that idea that the legal system tells us something about and helps us to modernize, helps us to be equal with other nations, and nevertheless has some real force, is I think the heart of the, of the legal systems in this part of the world that I'm talking about. My account emphasizes great continuities between the Meiji period and the post-war period in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And that's somewhat unusual. Many people think of the war as being a sharp break. When you think about the legal system as a legal system and the legal bureaucracy, I don't think it was as sharp a break as others might say. Essentially, this Meiji era legal system, which was of course transplanted to Taiwan and Korea in the colonial era before World War II, um, featured three important features, three interlocking sets of institutions. It had a pretty good judiciary that nevertheless operated in a very small zone. That is, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, uh, um, it was restricted in some sense, in a bureaucratic sense, to the traditional zones of legal activity. Criminal law and civil law wasn't dealing much with constraining the government. It had a very small legal profession, in big contrast from the United States, where the legal profession is often a driver of legal reform. And third, it had uh, legal rules that insulated the state. Again, contrast the United States. We've always thought of law as a constraint against the state. Generally speaking, the idea of Meiji Japan and the developmental state in general is that you hire really smart people to be the bureaucrats, give them a lot of discretion, and stay out of their hair. Don't tie them down with a lot of procedures. Don't have a lot of transparency. Don't have a lot of um, ability for people to sue them while they're making their you know, wise decisions to guide the economy. And you could see why all of this, this configuration um, would be supportive of what I was calling performance legitimacy. Right? It sort of works with the developmental state, perfectly developmental form of legality. And um, in my view, very successful, worthy perhaps of emulation if other countries could somehow get it right. All right, um, that set of institutions operated roughly till about 1990, in my account. Um, even as late as 1990, there were only 500 people a year passing the bar exam in Japan. 500 a year in a country of 120 million people. Not very many lawyers. The judges in post-war Japan, uh, not one of them, not one, has ever been found to engage in any form of judicial corruption. It's remarkable. And during this period, there was great insulation of the administrative state. The bureaucrats ran Japan. At least that's what we were told. So what happens? How come you know, two decades after this, things have changed? Well, scholars of institutional change um, you know, have a kind of paradigm. And I suppose I subscribe to this. You can have a set of institutions which are mutually supportive and kind of an equilibrium, if you will. And it will be stable until something happens from outside. Something shocks the system. And then there's kind of a scramble and an attempt to find a new equilibrium. And that's broadly speaking what happened. In around 1990, you have the financial crisis in Japan, the end of the um, Showa bubble, as it was called. You have a, um, and it was a very severe financial crisis, a, you know, akin to what we suffered in 2007 and 2008 if not greater. Uh, you have pressures for democratization in Korea and Taiwan. And you have initiated then these um, programs of trying to establish a new equilibrium. And for, as we saw in the Meiji era, law was central. Many people said, well, one way to try to solve the problems of our society is to fix the legal system. And uh, you know, again, law as a kind of, um, space or law as a tool, a mechanism of modernization. The way we will save our entire country is by fixing the laws. So there was a lot of pressure for legal reform. Just to trace some of the details, um, and I'll start with Japan. Um, Japan really, things after the 1990s sort of bubble bursting, there was a period of great uncertainty and it took about five years. But beginning around 1998, there were a number of, number of very significant changes to the legal system. There was, for the first time, a creation of a nonprofit organization law. They didn't even have a concept of nonprofit organizations. They passed their first administrative procedures law. 
which is a law by which citizens can find out what the administration is doing. They passed a freedom of information law. These are, you know, of let's say OECD countries, Japan would have been the last to adopt any of those things. Those things were already well established in every industrial democracy. In Japan, they weren't necessary because the bureaucrats ran the show. So it's a sign that things were changing, that they begin to adopt these things in the late 1990s. And then in a very remarkable month, in 1998, uh, you know, apparently by coincidence, but it couldn't possibly be this way, there were reports that came out from the Liberal Democratic Party, party which ran Japan for many, many decades, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, one of the main central developmental bureaucracies, and the Kei Danren, which those of you who study East Asia know is the big business organization in Japan. The three sort of pillars of society all came out and said, what we need is legal reform. Obviously, there was some coordination behind the scenes in typical Japanese fashion. We don't really know. But no doubt, this couldn't have been coincidence that they all called for it at the same time. And a few months later, a law was passed to create a Justice System Reform Council, a body to deliberate and to propose reform of the legal system. And um, invoking the Meiji era, actually, in their, in their law and in their initial statements, they talked about how reviving the law and changing the legal system would modernize Japan, would help make Japan the equal of European and Western powers, even though Japan was richer than most of Western Europe by this point. Um, they talked about the idea of making law the flesh and blood of the nation, kind of a scary term, but, um, and they talked about expanding participation, changing the citizenry through changing the legal system. They talked about changing the society from one of planning, of ex-ante planning, where bureaucrats would kind of figure out what the society was going to do and then implement it, to one of what they called ex-post control. Ex-post control, what is that? That means bureaucrats don't plan things. Rather, you know, you let people do what they want, and when there are problems, when there's a tort or a, some environmental pollution, then you solve it through remedies afterwards. So it's much more like a liberal kind of idea. In a liberal society, we let people do what they want, and only when there's a problem do we make one pay the other. Very different from a kind of planning-oriented society, which was a socialist view and the developmental state view. So they wanted to change the legal system to do this. How did they do it? How did they propose doing it? Well, they needed to increase the number of lawyers. They proposed adding a system of lay participation. What's lay participation? Jury. They were going to introduce citizens into the criminal decision-making process. Quite a radical change. They wanted to promote the rights of victims in the legal system, in the criminal justice system. They wanted to change the way judges were hired, and I haven't gone into detail on it, but uh, judges traditionally were, you know, you join the judiciary, you'd spend your whole career there. They wanted to have judges who were drawn from the ranks of practicing lawyers, as we do in the United States. You can be a lawyer, you're typically a lawyer before you're a judge. And they wanted to make administrative litigation easier. And many other things, civil procedure. They proposed a very radical set of reforms in the legal system. Now, um, interestingly, many of these things have been implemented. It reflects, I think, a, you know, within the overall story I'm telling, a partic particularly Japanese approach. You get everyone to get together and you plan what's going to happen, and then you know, very good, careful implementation. Most of these things have happened. We now have 72 law schools in Japan, which are graduate law schools, like the law schools in the United States. Previously, legal education was just an undergraduate degree. Since 2008, we've had eight or 9,000 jury trials in Japan with ordinary citizens participating in the decision-making process. They've introduced a very interesting idea, a prosecutorial review commission it's somewhat like our grand jury. So those of you who aren't lawyers, the grand jury in the United States has to confirm when the prosecutor wants to indict someone for a crime. Ordinary citizens do that. And in Japan, very radically, they have a commission now which can um, actually overrule the prosecutors, particularly when they decide not to indict someone. So ordinary citizens are, are participating in the decision to indict people or not. Very famously, they indicted Ozawa Ichiro, one of the most prominent politicians in Japan, um, a couple years ago. And they overruled the prosecutors. 
New mechanisms for appointing judges with citizens participating in that. New mechanisms for victims' rights. You get the flavor. In area after area, they were trying to encourage ordinary citizens to be involved in the legal system. This was not the result of some bottom-up demand. There was no citizens' movement to try to get involved. Indeed, surveys showed that most Japanese had no desire to participate in the system. What am I going to do? How am I going to make up the work if I miss work and have to go to the jury? What a you know, pain in the butt. No one wanted to do it. And yet, uh, what, people, what the evidence has shown in the first few years of the experiment is that people really enjoy it. They all think that it's kind of uh, um, a valuable experience. And it, it, it in some, to some degree, echoes our own ideology of the jury. One reason that we have the jury is to promote active citizenship. And that seems to be happening a little bit in Japan. Um, well, what to make of this experiment in Japan so far? I think it's, you know, many of the reforms have been adopted. Many of them have been successful. Um, it's very much been a top-down process, not one of citizen demand. I want to now move to the other cases, and I'll talk to them more quickly. Um, Korea and Taiwan. And these are countries which were starting in very different, although the legal system was very much Japanese in orientation, in Korea, into the 1980s, when the Koreans wanted to pass a new statute, they would sometimes just get the Japanese version and change the word Japan to Korea and, and pass it exactly in that form. So they were very much um, enthralled to a legal system of their former colonial power who they didn't like very much. Nevertheless, they were you know, drawing from that. So very heavily influenced by the Japanese system. They experienced, though, and this to some degree is parallel in Taiwan, a very radical set of changes associated with democratization. Um, and it was much more bottom-up. In, uh, of course, there was a military dictatorship and efforts to democratize. And the adoption in 1987 of a new constitution with a number of um, important features. It was a presidential system. And it had, for the first time in East Asia, a constitutional court. Constitutional court, a special body just to decide constitutional issues. Um, actually, Taiwan has had one for a while, but the Korean one was very active. Japan never had anything like that. And they passed a number of very radical laws to try to do some of the same things the Japanese were doing in terms of opening up the administrative state to um, more transparency. The Constitutional Court decided many important decisions. And uh, an emphasis throughout on participation. In one very important case, the Constitutional Court of Korea was confronted with a law in which the parliament had voted to move the capital. It was an election promise. You can imagine like Barack Obama running for president saying, you know, I really want all those uh, votes in Texas so that if you, if you Texans vote for me, I'll move the capital to Houston. It was that kind of promise that the, the president made. And they passed the law. The Constitutional Court, though, said something very interesting. You can't do that because Seoul has been the capital of Korea for 600 years. It's part of the unwritten constitution of our country. And in order to make such a fundamental change, you would have to have a referendum. You'd have to have the public vote on it. The court basically made up all these things. It's a tremendous usurpation of judicial power. No one said that the court could make up the constitution. No one, there's no word in there about unwritten constitution. And the constitution doesn't say anything about Seoul being the permanent capital. They grabbed this power. Nevertheless, no one really criticized them. Why? Well, because they were hanging it on the hat of participation. As long as the public blessed it, it would be OK. And that seems to have been a legitimate argument, more or less, in South Korea. So you've seen a very radical kind of change. It was led, uh, in many cases, by citizens' movements and lawyers' movements. Very important figure, a man named Pak Wan Soon had spent a couple years in the United States and had uh, soaked up the techniques of amnesty and the ACLU and you know, social change through litigation. And he and his group sued many, many times. They used the new statutes and they uh, pressured for a greater reform. They were only able, and, 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 and they led to many, many social changes in which participation was really important. His group was called the Particip People's Society for Participatory Democracy. And he called it a um, political party without aspiration for power. 
He's currently the mayor of Seoul, actually, so eventually he did aspire to political power. But, uh, but at least the idea was that we would change the society without actually holding power. Very lawyerly kind of approach. And tremendous changes have happened in South Korea. In terms of the legal institutions, the kinds of things I was talking about with juries and law schools and such, there was a lot of pressure to do this in Korea, but it was quite unsuccessful until one of the activist lawyers himself, No Mu Hyun, became president in 2003, and then they were able to adopt many of these reforms. And uh, in some, to some degree, and I don't want to go into too many details, but um, they learned a little bit from the things the Japanese had adopted, and um, they've adopted many of the same rules. Um, new law schools, more lawyers, um, victims' rights, lay participation, etc. Fundamental changes involving much more participation in the legal system. The process was different, much more adversarial, much more contentious. They had the help of the courts that were willing to step in, the Constitutional Court in particular. Nevertheless, they end up at kind of the same place. Finally, I'll say a word about Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan also was a society undergoing great democratization pressure. An interesting twist in Taiwan is that many of the, and those of you who know anything about the society know that for many years it was divided between so-called native Taiwanese, people whose families have been there for, let's say, 300 years, against mainlanders, people whose families had only been there for 50 or 60 years. And this was a fundamental cleavage with mainlanders running the society, small percentage. With democratization, obviously that had to change. And many of the people involved in the democratization movement were themselves lawyers who had been, um, who were of Taiwanese descent. And they were fighting, unlike the Korean guy, they were fighting for political power. And they were also fighting for more participation at the same time. And using a similar strategy, a lot of litigation, but also using an electoral strategy, they eventually took power and have tried to undertake a similar set of reforms. And I won't spend too much time on the, on the differences. There's some slight differences in process. But at this point, the Taiwanese have adopted many of the same institutions um, as the other countries. Again, graduate legal education, victims' rights, much more open administrative law processes, uh, now a criminal jury starting next year, I understand, um, and um, a kind of expansion in the role of the judiciary in the society. Well, to me, it's a very interesting story. Three systems start in the same place. They each have their own politics. They each have their own processes. And yet there's something, it almost seems like there's something structural involved because they all end up in very similar places. And I want to emphasize these are not universal changes. If you go to the legal system of France or Sweden, you won't see the same set of reforms. There's a kind of regional clustering of the decisions that were made in East Asia, such that, uh, Northeast Asia, such that we can talk about a kind of, perhaps a genetic similarity among the systems. Um, and that's a bit of a puzzle, why that would be. Partly, it must have to do with the idea that reformers, in trying to pursue arguments about trying to make reform, can draw from each other. The Koreans can say, look, the Japanese have done this. Now it's time for us to do that. Taiwanese can say, look, the Koreans have done this. And look how it's working. Societies that are closer together in culture and history, which share discourse, which share levels of um, layers, if you will, of legal influence from ancient Chinese to modern J Japanese to actually post-war American would naturally draw lessons from each other. And in that sense, it's a kind of diffusion story where the countries in the same area are, are um, learning from each other. Um, there was not, and I want to emphasize this because too many analyses um, emphasize sort of globalization. You know, there's not a universal result, nor was there any external pressure. I started my talk talking about Cameroon and Cambodia. Small, weaker societies are subject to direct pressure to reform their legal system, um, sometimes involving some of the same reforms I've talked about. But these are very rich societies. Korea and Japan are OECD members. I think Taiwan is the 15th biggest economy in the world, even though it's not a very large country. They didn't have to listen to anyone, nor was anyone pushing them to do any of this. It is not crude Americanization or crude American pressure to adopt these kind of reforms. Um, something else is going on. Um, 
I think that there's you know, sort of two levels of, of, of um, interesting thing going on in this story. One is that there, oh, and I want to add another thing that was not there, was regional um, organization. If you think about Europe, if you think about Africa, if you think about Latin America, there are regional organizations, regional courts, you know, European Union, Free Trade Association, et cetera, which are mechanisms for coordinating reforms across countries and sources of pressure to adopt particular reforms. East Asia is distinct. It's the only region of the world without a human rights court. It's the only re um, region of the world without a free trade union, a general one for the region. And you know that's got complex reasons why it's the case. But uh, for our purposes, it suggests that there's something else going on in terms of why these countries adopted things. You know, because our series here is called you know, Cultures of Law, you know, I have to say it's some deep cultural idea, I think, that somehow you are legitimated through symbolic participation. That, and of course, not everyone's going to be a juror. Not everyone's going to sit on the prosecutorial review commission and such. Not everyone's going to bring an administrative lawsuit. But the idea that you can do that is a source, I believe, of legitimacy in these East Asian countries that we're talking about now. Now, I haven't talked much about China, and I do think, though, that some of these similar pressures are occurring. One of the great problems of modern China is the lack of mechanisms of participation, of course. Um, and I don't mean just electoral, but that people, when they feel like they can't participate, they do things like, you know, light themselves on fire to prevent their land from being taken. Not being consulted in the decision, not having a, an ability to change um, the outcome of government is a great source of illegitimacy, the greatest one for China. And I can't help but wonder if there aren't some of the same similar pressures uh, going on. It's not out of the, it, you know, it's, it's interesting that many of the reforms I've talked about have and are being adopted in China. There's a system of lay participation that comes from the socialist era. There's um, a lot of emphasis on changing legal education and a great emphasis on law as a key of modernity. So it is possible that we would see some sort of, um, some kind of implications of this story for China. Um, nevertheless, I do think it's a, it's a peculiarly East Asian story, and it's one in which the outcomes were not predicted in some sense by the interests that were lined up at the outset. If you read conventional accounts of these processes, particularly the Japanese one, you'll be told that it was big business that was demanding these fundamental changes in the Japanese legal system. I find that very hard to believe when one looks at the outcomes. I can't figure out what the K. Donrin, the Big Business Federation, why they would care about the rights of victims in a criminal trial. Why would they would care about citizens being able to overrule prosecutors? That must be something else. It must be a demand. Maybe one way to think about it is a distrust of professions. That, you know, for many years in this East Asian context, professions were the ones running the society. You'd hire bureaucrats, let them do what they wanted, and um, they monopolized policy making in their own area. In the justice system was the Ministry of Justice and the Bar Association and the judges, just as in the health uh, you know, area would be the doctors and the ministry. So there's kind of local monopolies that monopolize things, and I think we're in an era where people distrust that kind of expertise. And that may go somewhere towards explaining it. Um, but with all of that, I'm, I really, in some sense, am only posing questions. Because as I say, I don't think there's a clean story. I do think it is a, um, a story of a fundamental change. And it may be something with implications for other parts of the world. Trying to think about modernity and modernization as involving um, a continuous process, which nowadays requires at least some symbolic participation by the people in order to get legitimacy. Uh, and having said all that, it's a complicated story, I know. Um, there's many more details I've left out. I think I should stop and uh, open up the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Jason. Oh, yeah, short hair. Role of, thank you, about the role of uh, lawyers, uh, which you mentioned several times, the increase in uh, legal education, growth in number of law schools, uh, growth in number of lawyers, because I'm having a little trouble seeing how that fits into the story about participation, because you might have a different account which says that, well, the rise of lawyers is actually uh, 
uh, antithetical to uh, ordinary participation uh, in the uh, legal process or in the government process uh, yeah. by ordinary citizens that they kind of displace uh, that sort of more general participatory role. So how does that fit exactly with your account? Great question. Uh, so let me just back up and give a basic fact for those of you who are unfamiliar. But when I, um, I said at one of the features of this sort of status quo ante was real caps on the number of lawyers. And the way that worked is that, uh, you know, they would set the quota and the nominal excuse in Japan is that they couldn't have any more because the training institute didn't have space. So it was really a kind of a, um, alliance, I suppose, between the government, which didn't want a lot of lawyers, and also those lawyers who'd already passed the bar, right? Because we know lawyers everywhere are monopolistic, right? You don't want too much new entry, too much competition, lawyers and everyone else. So um, that was the status quo. Any lawyers were pretty comfortable, but um, in, and therefore, in the Japanese case in particular, they had really no, not much direct involvement at the beginning. There had been legal academics who had these kind of pet projects about reform, uh, but it wasn't driven by them in any sense. They really played catch up, and they seemed to primarily still be interested in their, in their own um, um, pocketbooks. There's now pressure from the Bar Association to close down a bunch of law schools there. Now, in Korea and Taiwan, it was different, and the dynamics were different, and that has to do with, notwithstanding the fact that there's the monopolistic pressures, there were small groups of activist lawyers with ties to the U.S. One of them, I should mention, Annette Liu, who later became vice president of Taiwan, uh, was trained here at the University of Illinois. She has a master's degree from here, and I interviewed her, actually, uh, some years ago, and she said, you know, Champaign-Urbana was the dawn of my enlightenment. You can quote her on that. Um, and what it was is that she was here and she saw the women, she was involved in the women's movement, it was early 1970s, and she got the idea that you could use law for social change. So I think it's not lawyers per se, it's just this particular group of activist lawyers that happened to be in the right place at the right time in the right historical configuration that were able to push it. In general, I think your question is uh, well-founded that lawyers aren't usually uh, looking for participation as a kind of mode of... Um, uh, gratification, but these these people were not motivated by their pocketbooks and much more by the um, by ideological considerations. Yes, in the back, in the pink, yeah. Um, that question sort of leads to the idea that there is um, aspirational pressure that. Maybe in those three countries there was not direct pressure from the outside to actually change, but there could have been aspirational pressure from people who had traveled abroad, particularly traveled to the U.S., had seen that in countries that perhaps they admired, participation was an important sort of thing, and that therefore if we are going to um, conform to our aspirations, um, that we need to do something like that. We need to be like those countries because that is a hallmark of what you know, that kind of civilization is like. Mm -hmm. Good, so um, I, you know, I think that's part of the story. It is a little bit puzzling. You always have people like that who want to do these things. And I, it, it, this is why I, I sort of wonder if it's not uh, um, you know, to some degree luck, right? You have institutions, they're stable. Something happens, and so then the system's open. And then you have a struggle. You have political struggles during reform episodes, after which, for whatever reason, the system stabilizes a little bit. And then you have a new equilibrium. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's the kind of, it's really a kind of sociological way of thinking about these episodes, I think, that's helpful for me. Because otherwise, I have trouble understanding why it is that sometimes these aspirational pressures succeed in some contexts, sometimes in places, other times they don't. Um, it has to be something about the interaction of the context, the openness of the system at a particular uh, time, when those people happen to be in position. And um, to some degree, it was smart strategy, I think, also, um, by the Taiwanese, for example, or the Korean activist lawyers. Um, so, you know, I think your, your question's right, but to, to really answer it as a kind of um, a generalizable hypothesis, we have to understand why sometimes those people are successful and other times they're not. I'm sure there are aspirational, um, you know, people have aspirational pressures in Syria today. It's not the right environment for, you know, tinkering around with liberal reforms. Thank you. Hi. 
uh, I know nothing about Japan, Korea, or Taiwan. But uh, from your account, um, and it follows a little bit of uh, your, your question, so I can see a scenario in which um, you know, the combination of these aspirations, and, or maybe you know, your reference to the Meiji uh, time when they were, you know, there was a sense that they had to become equal so that they could participate in the, in the international, um, 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 in the international arena. So, I mean, I can think of a, a not knowing anything about it, of a scenario in which there is, you know, this shock, there is a bureaucracy that is capable and probably willing to, um, to change, and you have, I mean, a, a, com a confluence of factors that probably can put together, um, you know, that can be used to explain this account. So I, I, can, I guess my question is, can you try to develop something that, that you know, give us more pieces of this possible puzzle? Yeah. Well, you know, obviously it's a, there's, there's a lot of detail, but I do think that uh, part of the problem, let's start with Japan, is that the bureaucracy wasn't trusted by the early 1990s. Why? Because there had been this financial crisis. Everyone was living, you know, high on the hog in the 1980s, and Japan was going to buy the Rockefeller Center. It did buy the Rockefeller Center. Kinda, and uh, you may remember, those of you old enough, that we feared being taken over by Japan in much the same way people talk about China today, which makes me think that that's also a bit of uh, paranoia or cultural insecurity. But um, nevertheless, you, ha you had these kind of sense that this was the society that was going to run the world, and then all of a sudden it wasn't. And the bureaucrats didn't have answers. They raised interest rates in a recession. There were scandals that were exposed, bureaucratic corruption scandals. In one famous incident, the, Bureau, the Ministry of Health distributed AIDS-tainted blood to hemophiliacs for a year after knowing that it was AIDS-tainted, killing many people. Why did they do that? Because they were in bed with the uh, blood supply company, which had you know, bought the bureaucrats a bunch of gifts and things like that. So these kind of garden variety store, uh, corruption stories came out, and that particular one actually ended up in the courts, remarkably, because courts are not usually involved in these kind of things. Um, Another thing around the same time, the great Hanshin earthquake in Kobe. Again, those of you who are a bit older may remember a huge earthquake in Kobe in 1995. Government was useless. Couldn't rescue. It was just very much like the 311 Fukushima thing where the government was nowhere to be found. And in the Kobe earthquake, there was an alternative group that showed up. It turned out to be the Yakuza, the mafia. The Japanese mafia showed up on the streets and was distributing food to people which was just a sign that the bureaucracy was totally incapable. And I think that that view uh, started to develop then. It's even more apparent now after the Fukushima crisis when you know, the government was essentially defending the, the TEPCO, which is quasi-governmental anyway. Um, and so there, all of this led to a kind of crisis in bureaucracy, I think. And if the bureaucracy is in crisis, you need mechanisms to constrain it. Well, law does provide for that. Law can protect the bureaucracy as it had for the previous 90 years, or it can make it more transparent. It's just a different kind of law. And so that was, I think, uh, part of the driving factor. In the other societies, the bureaucracy was less trusted because it was tied up in these authoritarian politics. Um, and so, you know, naturally, there was, there was much more natural, I suppose, story to be told. Something you might see in Brazil or many other countries when there's democratization pressure, there's also pressure on these state bureaucrats who were serving the dictators so dutifully. Um, and, for, and much more pressure for transparency and such. So that's, I think, a more conventional, easy to understand story. Yes. So uh, maybe it's the same question and the wording. So I, I wonder the extent to which uh, what you're describing in the 90s and 2000s basically reflects the same dynamics as in the 19th century. I mean, there's a consensus at some point at these societies as Japan. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, and these three societies at the end of the 1990s, that something is not working very well because you know the economy is not growing anymore. They're going through a period of stagnation, which was not clear for economists why East Asia was going through this process of stagnation at that point. And they basically somehow again do exactly what they did 100 years uh, before, which is kind of, well, we're stagnated. For some reason, we're not playing. Um, face-to-face -face with the other industrialized economies. So what we need to do is basically reform ourselves to become more similar to the other industrialized uh, economies. And mm -hmm. so all these little reforms make, it, uh, make 
East Asia looked more American, much the same way 100 years earlier, those reforms made Japan and Korea, and to some extent even um, China, look more like Germany. Hmm. And I wonder if it's basically the same kind of process by which, A, you recognize you're slowing down and you're not talking in equal footing with, uh, with the West, and B, so we need to look, look uh, more like the West, and so we somehow make legal reforms to look more similar to the West. Good. And one, uh, those of you, I did distribute a paper to the fellows at the Center for Advanced Study, and those of you who read that will notice that in some places I talk about this idea of competitive modernization. And it really goes back to a, a worldview, which I think is prevalent in East Asia, which isn't necessarily prevalent everywhere else. And that is the idea that the world is organized hierarchically. Some countries are more powerful, some are weaker. And, you know, it's the job of our state to move us up in that hierarchy. Korea is always competing with Japan. Japan is always competing with China. China is the center of the world, number one. Uh, and, and many development efforts, the purpose of the state in some sense is to advance the country as a whole within a hierarchically ordered world. Now, those of you from other parts of the world can correct me. I don't think that that is felt as deeply in the Caribbean or in sub-Saharan Africa, where the state is sometimes itself very open to question. In part, it's because these are very old states, real nation states, um, maybe the only part of the world where you have genuine nation states, um, as per the myth. And um, so that's kind of a natural way to see the job of the government, to help you compete in a world which isn't particularly friendly, in which other states are always trying to outcompete you. And, um, you know, modernization is really about that. The problem I sort of, you know, puzzle with is that, oh, and I should say that, that that's, your, your question is clearly correct in that that was, I think, much of the motivation for mobilizing people and much of the discourse that was used. So when the Japanese Justice System Reform Council was, um, trying to legitimate itself in its initial reports, it said, just like the other great transformations of the Japanese legal system, just like the Meiji era, just like after World War II, we had to change our legal system to be modern, to compete, so we are doing it again. So they're really quite explicit about that. Um, and then you look around and you adopt reforms, as you say, you kind of take what's prestigious, what's out there, what seems to resonate, I suppose, with the people, and, you know, they, they were reluctant to say, no, if you said that something was an American reform, that didn't help. So to say that you were, in fact, at one point, the law schools were called ro skuru in Japan, law school. Um, but that didn't go well, so they had to come up with a Japanese name. Um, um, graduate schools of law is what they ended up calling them. Um, and so, so it was implicit, not explicit. Nevertheless, many of the reforms did end up kind of moving the legal system in a somewhat American direction. Um, but I w again want to resist, and so, you know, your question is basically why, but I want to resist the idea that this is um, um, some kind of general Americanization, not only because, there's, you know, there was an explicit aversion to that, but also because, um, as in much of the post-World War II period, if you looked at the Japanese Constitution, you compared it with the American, you'd say these things are really very similar, right? Right to free speech, you know, right to fair trial but it's been implemented in quite a different way in Japan. And similarly with these reforms, we see that they kind of diverge in pretty fundamental ways. So you can have the same reform on the surface, yet it's a very different thing. And as you know, there's a kind of big debate in comparative law about you know, whether institutions can ever be borrowed. There's, um, there's clearly a flavor in which these are very different and operating under their own logic. Um, so that's a long answer to the question, but basically I do think this idea of competitive modernization is something that's driving things. These states are competing with each other. They are competing with other countries in the world. And to do that, to compete, you have to continually modernize when you're not performing economically. It's uh, pretty unique from um, other parts of the world. It's, uh, I mean, in my opinion, like China is more, even more um, different from other parts of the world. And as the, as the progress of, mod, uh, of globalization and more and more, um, I mean, foreign, I mean, Western, um, even, for example, like American, um, corporations enter the market of, of China. However, they seem to take a role which is not, which is not represent the uh, legal idea or, 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 the, or the idea of law of the West. Uh, rather, they participate 
really heavily in some illegal actions in China, such as corruption. So um, it seems that the impact of Western, Western, law, Western legal system is not significant um, for those uh, corporations, even for the Chinese society as a whole. So I was just wondering, and I was, want to ask you a question that, do you think that China will evolve into a legal system which resemble the counterpart in the West, mm. or will it go on its own way? Thank yes. you. Well, that's a great uh, question, and a huge question. Is China you know, going to develop the rule of law? And there's much debate, and much of the debate is uh, in, as we say in English, has the quality of some people saying the glass is half full and other people saying the glass is half empty. There have been many, many developments in the Chinese legal system which are very, very good and I think bode very well actually for something like the rule of law in 10 or 20 or 50 years. Um, and I think one of the best developments is that um, Chinese government is supporting many people to study law and allowing many people to study law and there's a pretty vigorous legal profession in China. Obviously, that is constrained. It's not supposed to be messing around with politics or doing social change litigation of the kind I described in Korea or Taiwan. And lawyers who engage in that will go to jail. So the government, in some sense, is trying to steer and avoid the story that I told. Nevertheless, I have a belief that in the long run, that's a hard thing to do. And that the law has a two-edged quality by virtue of its universality. And uh, you know, it, it has the ability to mobilize the, the the rules of the rulers against them down the road in ways that we can't even anticipate. So I think the combination of a really vigorous legal profession and a law-based system uh, is one that might lead to a kind of convergence in that point. Um, the courts in China have their, had their ups and downs, right, in terms of their autonomy from politics. Uh, the Supreme Court has, in some sense, maybe was a little early in the early 2000s in trying to claim a much larger role. But um, you know, I'm of the belief that as the society gets richer and richer, you'll see something much more like the rule of law exist in China. Because at some point, it's necessary for development. You can't run a society in which everyone is uh, you know, corrupt and which there are no rules. You can't run an economy that way. Um, and so at some level of economic complexity, there will be demand for something like the rule of law. Of course, it'll have its own Chinese flavor. You know, I'm, I don't deny that. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think the glass is half full. If you call that optimistic, you might say it's bad. But from my point of view, it's a good thing. In terms of you start, uh, you start out your question about uh, asking about foreign corporations and engaging in illegal practices. And obviously, you know, anything that he, not only is it likely to be against Chinese law, but it's also against American law. We have a law which criminalizes the paying of bribes in foreign countries, and as you may have read in the newspapers, some very important American companies, J.P. Morgan and such, are now under investigation for you know, hiring the princelings and such. And so that's, a, that's an example of extraterritorial application of American law. It's very important, important for our own rule of law. I actually think there's going to be very interesting problems down the road as China itself moves towards extraterritorial application of its own laws. That's going to lead to some very interesting regulatory conflicts between the United States and China. But that's all part of development. Nothing to worry too much about. Yes, Ms. Ku. So Tom, I wonder um, kind of to push you into the future a little bit where you see all this um, going. I mean, you mentioned already that in Japan there will be law schools closing down. There are numbers of lawyers educated in these new systems who are not finding jobs, having incurred debt to go to these um, graduate schools. You know, I don't know if um, the jury system has had any effects on costs and length of trials and things of this nature. So I see very much your story in achieving kind of these initial goals in terms of participatory uh, legitimacy. But what kinds of tests would you put to kind of determine how this is going into the future, say, I don't know, a decade from now or something like that? And, or just what do you predict is kind of the next phase of all this? All right, let me first say something methodological, which is when you're looking and trying to evaluate these things, you always have to look at unanticipated consequences. If you go talk to the average Japanese law professor or even the Korean or Taiwanese law professors, they'll say Japanese law school education reform was a disaster. Uh, the Korean one's a little better. 
Taiwan's much more market-based, so that's fine. Um, they would say that the jury system is by and large a good thing, you know. And I guess what I'd, I'd say is, well, let's, you know, even the so-called failure of the law school system has had some anticipated consequences, likely to continue to do so. They're trading lots of people in law, um, and they're not all getting jobs as traditional lawyers. That's largely just as in our system, because people don't want to go to you know, the rural parts of the country and work as solo practitioners. Nevertheless, there has been a number of people who've done that. So you have better delivery of legal services in Japan than you did before. You have much better trained corporate counsel, people going in-house, very strong uh, folks are doing that. And you have a kind of uh, opening up of the legal profession because you have people you know, who are undergraduate art majors or history majors going to law school and getting degrees. And I think that's good intellectually for the law um, and a kind of you know, just much more fluid kind of process where you don't have to decide what you're going to do at the age of 18. And I think that's good for Japanese society too. So notwithstanding the current uh, um, struggles, which are pretty easy to solve, that really has to do with that bar, bar exam system. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and, and probably closing a few of the schools consolidating, that, um, that nevertheless, it's, uh, you know, I think that midterm, I'm pretty optimistic. It's hard to know how you would get at the deeper question. In the United States, we are told that the jury enhances our democracy. How do we know that? You know, how do we get at that? Well, we can't do an experiment where, you know, some states have juries and other states don't. So it's just kind of part of our ideology. Uh, but maybe you'd look at you know, levels of citizen attachment. You'd see whether ex-jurors in Japan were more likely to engage in non-government organizations and civic organizations, things like that. If the goal was to create citizens, then you'd have to look at those kind of things. So um, I don't necessarily have a strong prediction of well, where it's going to go, but I have some ideas about how we go about figuring it out. Yes, Diana. Um. One of the, the reasons why um, juries developed in this country was um, the practice of nullification, to actually rule on the laws as opposed to um, the facts. And we, of course, I mean, through time have made it so we don't want the public to know that. This is a deep, dark secret, and you can go to jail by, you know, if you tell juries that this is available. When these juries are coming up in other countries, is nullification a part of any of this, or is this just a factual sort of jury activity? No, uh, nullification would be totally foreign to, um, you know, and I actually know because I've talked with some of the designers of the jury system over there, they didn't want to talk about it, you know, they know about the United States, but they, they don't think it's an important argument. They think it's a losing argument for adopting a jury. You have to remember that, you know, um, these, are, these are modernist kind of, cultures, with uh, political cultures, in which the state's legitimacy is seen as fundamental. The state has been legitimate for 2,000 something years, and so it's not called into question every day as we do in our country. Uh, and we, people aren't attracted by the idea of overruling the state on a specific law. Instead, you know, the juries are much more about just you know, deciding the facts, deliberating with the judges um, and such. I think it's had an, um, and you know, I do think it has a nice salutary effect on the legal professions, though, on judges and prosecutors, knowing that they have to speak in ordinary language, right? Knowing that they have to explain and try to persuade jurors to go along with them and such. That's important. It changes, makes the language of the law much more like everyday language. And um, major procedural changes where instead of having a civil or criminal trial, they would have 20 or 30 appearances, different stages, because it was just a bunch of professionals. Now they have a concentrated procedure. And I think those kind of things are quite good. Um, for whatever it's worth, you see a little few more you know, crime dramas and law dramas like we have in the United States, one of the great American exports. We might get some competition in that regard down the road. So um, these are cultural things. But jury nullification, not part of the cultural milieu. Sir? All right. Well, thank you all very much for your uh, attention and for coming here. I appreciated the questions. They're helpful in my thinking and um, look forward to talking more.